Hey, it's the first Prez Monday check-in. We'll have a chat, but not spill tea. Hey, it's the first Prez Monday check-in. We got the Bible and Greg and me. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Monday check-in with me. Uh, who am I? Damon Jensen Heitman, that's who I am. I'm one of the pastors at First Press Hastings, and I'm joined by... Greg Allen Pickett, the other pastor at First Press Hastings. Still basking in the joy of the second Sunday of Advent at First Presbyterian Church. The second Sunday? You're going The third way back. Sunday. Excuse me, still bas- <laughs> you don't, you don't even remember. It was hope the second Sunday. Mm-hmm. This Sunday was joy. I'm basking in the joy of the worship service we just experienced yesterday. And Why? Uh, it was delightful. <laughs> Say more. Starting. I would <laughs> tell me more about that. <laughs> um, uh, well, of course, our children help present the message uh, through the form of the children's Christmas program, Angels Aware, and they did a great job. Um, and it was just a time of wonderful joy. Yeah, they did do a really nice job. I thought some. I could. I could hear them, you know? Yeah. They were up there. It seemed like they were having fun. It seemed like the congregation was having fun as well. So, yeah. A good good retelling of the Christmas story from a different perspective of the angels in heaven learning the news of the incarnation. So that that was great. Yeah. I may have said it on this show before. I may not have. But that program, Angels Aware, was published for the first time in the Mm mid-80s in my church in 1988 when I had just turned 11 years old. Mm -hmm. I chose to do Angels Aware as the the children's program at church. Mm -hmm. So I was familiar with it. (laughs) And the songs in that program were so deeply embedded in my head from 1988 that they're still with me today. And I hope they stick with our kids as well in the same way. Uh, It's how I know my Ten Commandments. There's a song about it. There's a song about it in Mm -hmm. the children's musical. And so somebody's like, Greg, what's the Seventh Commandment? And I start going, number one, we've just begun. And I get to seven. I'm like, number seven, life is heaven when you're true to your mate. Uh, Number seven is don't commit adultery. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, how often do you find yourself in a situation where someone asks you, apropos of nothing, Greg, what's the, what's the Eighth Commandment? Number eight, don't steal and break this rule for... It's uh, don't steal. <laughs> okay. And you just asked me, apropos of nothing. Well, I guess it wasn't oh. apropos of nothing. Um, it doesn't happen too often. <laughs> and uh, it is an, always a learning opportunity when somebody does ask me about the commandments to let them know that they are listed twice in the Bible and they're listed slightly differently each time. And so yeah. it's important to uh, make that distinction. Well... But we're not going to talk about any of the commandments this coming Sunday. I mean, we could. I'm not. Greg, you might, I guess. It's not high on the list of I make that priorities. pledge to people right now. I'm but you're not going to bring up the commandments? I'm not going to talk about any of the commandments on Sunday. Wow. That's a, that's a bold statement. Mm-hmm. That's, I know. It's controversial, but I'm going to do it. All right. Well, we'll see. Mm-hmm. If I change the prayer of confession to include the Ten Commandments, and you're leading that prayer of confession, does that count as you talking about the Ten Commandments? Just skip them. I'll have a mysterious (laughs) coughing fit (laughs) at that moment. Fair enough. What's the Monday check-in, Damon? The Monday check-in is a thing uh, where we essentially do a little preview of the upcoming Sunday. We take a look at the scripture that we're going to use for that Sunday. And we talk a little bit about some of its themes, ideas, questions that we have for it, questions that perhaps it has for us, and have a little mini Bible study. And then following that, we switch gears. We talk a little bit about the life of the church, First Pres Hastings, Nebraska. And we oftentimes start with a word of prayer. Whose turn is it for that? I think it's yours. Okay, let's pray. Loving and gracious God, as we continue our Advent preparation, as we continue to, to do the work of opening our, heart, opening our hearts and opening our minds to greet Emmanuel, God, with us yet again, ask your spirit that your presence might be with us 
as we study your word, as we reflect upon its meaning and importance for our own lives. In your gracious and loving name we pray. Amen. Amen. This coming Sunday, uh, we are actually going to do a Lessons and Carols service. Yes. Uh, so there will be m- uh, more scripture readings than we might typically have on a Sunday morning. All of them are going to be related uh, to the birth of Jesus the Christ. And one of those is from, is I assume, one is this the one actually in the service? This be. is in the service, and this is actually the, the gospel lectionary text for the fourth Sunday of Advent for year A. Um, for those of you who have been tracking with us through Advent, I've uh, we've looked at the Isaiah prophecies for the first three Sundays of Advent. Uh, and this week we're switching gear to actually do the gospel lesson, which leads us up to the birth narrative. Um, and this Sunday in church, we will actually get to the birth narrative as well because it's the service of lessons and carols. But my sermon will focus on this particular passage. One, because it's the lectionary text. Mm-hmm. Two, because I've been thinking about it. <laughs> those, are two, those are two good reasons But so I've been far. thinking about it not because it's the lectionary text. I've been thinking about it because it's the text that I wrote for the Advent devotional guide. Oh, yeah. And so it was already sort of front of mind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then three, there's the, our celebrate band, our praise band mm-hmm. is, 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 is playing a song on Sunday that uses the term hallelujah a lot. And I don't think we think much about that word when we sing it or say it. So I want to think a little bit about Interesting words, and so I'm going to look at the word hallelujah and the word Emmanuel, both words that are not in our common lexicon, our common English language. Sure. You don't generally go around saying hallelujah or Emmanuel, and yet every Advent, these are words that come to us. So we'll spend a little bit of time reflecting on the words hallelujah and Emmanuel. Yeah. I might even get the congregation to like a, like a call and response type thing. I say hallelujah. You say Emmanuel. Hallelujah. Emmanuel. Hallelujah. Emmanuel. Yeah, something like that. It's done. <laughs> we don't. Yeah. So this is from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Uh, it reads something like this. <clears throat> now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill, most likely, yeah, to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. That's it. Greg, what do you got? Uh, Well, we can place this a little bit in its context. So this this reading started at verse 18 of chapter 1. Verses uh, 1 through 17 are what are typically called the Matthew genealogy. It traces the lineage of, Uh, so that it can connect Jesus with the house of David. Mm -hmm. And then... um, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of so-and-so, 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 and 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 Jesse the father of King David. And it drones on for uh, a lot of verses. Mm -hmm. So we don't... David was the father of Solomon. (laughs) So we don't usually read that part in church. But this is the crux of that, because um, the important part for... Jewish followers of Jesus was was linking the lineage of King David and these messianic prophecies that the, the this all that we've been studying from the book of Isaiah to the birth of Jesus and this is this is what does it 
right? Because Jesus has to be from the house of David. But then we're presented with this quandary because Joseph is, is not the biological father of Jesus. Right. So how do we connect Jesus with the house of David? And, and this little section of Matthew 18 through 25 resolves that for us because Joseph uh, chooses to be the father of Jesus. He chooses not to dismiss Mary. And then uh, I was just reading a commentary that said when the, um, when the angel says to him, she will bear a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. In the act of naming Jesus, uh, apparently in first century Palestinian custom, mm -hmm. that would have meant that Joseph is sort of taking on that yoke of fatherhood by, hmm. by naming the child, whether the child is biologically his or not, he's saying, I'm the child of Jesus. I'm going to follow the directions of his angel and name the child. And in, in the act of naming, that is what links Jesus to the Davidic lineage. Okay. So if you give a person a name, you are, um, you're almost by default accepting some sort of responsibility for that yeah. person. Yeah. It's an interesting, it's Which an interesting I, thought. I didn't actually know until I read uh, a commentary about this in preparation for this, and I thought that was interesting. I don't know that that's that I'm going to preach on that necessarily, but it's kind of an interesting detail in this passage that we generally read almost every Advent. Yeah. Um, we read the Annunciation of the Angel to Mary, letting her know that she's carrying the child, which is in the Gospel of Luke. Yeah. And then we read, read the Annunciation of the Angel to Joseph, which is here in the Gospel of Matthew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if we don't only read it on a Sunday leading up to Christmas... Then it gets read on Christmas Eve. Right. Or something as well. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, uh, there's the lineage, right? And there's other, you know, we would call these scriptural echoes, right? Right. Uh, but this is, what's in here is more than an echo. It's a, it's a kind of a quote. <laughs> yeah. From Isaiah. Yeah. Um, that takes place actually within the passage that we, that we read. So there's these multiple to what has come before I think right um, that's the wrong thing that's not going to help me this alright we get this uh, quote kind of from Isaiah uh, in verse 23 look the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall name him Emmanuel which means God with us um Right, if memory serves, that's not exactly how it reads in Isaiah. Correct. It's a bit of an interpretation. Yes. So that's Isaiah seven fourteen that is being quoted. Um, the the commentary that I read referred to this as one of Matthew's frequent, and it uses the term formula quotations. Okay, what's his formula? Well, the formula is that you've got to read the Christ story back into the Old Testament prophecies. Mm -hmm. And so this is the first of these formula quotations that help us build this formula of X equals Y, right? Sure. Of Messiah equals Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so it calls it the first of the formula quotations in which he confirms the truth or significance of something he's reporting by referring to scripture. That's sort of the formula sure. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I not encountered that term formula quotations, but it makes a ton of sense mm -hmm. to me. Um, yeah. So. As it was in days of old, right? I mean, you yes. just you take a little quick peek into into chapter two there, right? And in verse five, they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And then. Verse and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah. Yes. yes. And yeah. Verse six is a quote. Uh, from scripture you go over here to verse 18 a voice was heard in Rama wailing in loud lamentation Rachel weeping for her children she refused to be consoled because they were no more um, that's another it, yeah. yeah so on and so forth chapter 3 this is the one people really probably know really well I'm mm -hmm. guessing uh, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord make straight his paths right and so John the baptizer then is quoting back we take Isaiah's words and we put them in John's mouth correct mm -hmm. yep and so this this particular commentator refers to these as formula quotations and it makes a lot of sense because the writer of the gospel of Matthew was trying really really hard 
to link the Jesus movement to the history of the Jewish people. That's why it starts with the genealogy. That's why we get the connection to the Davidic heritage or lineage. Mm -hmm. So that any Old Testament prophecy that talks about a Messiah coming from the line of David can now be read as Jesus fulfills that prophecy, right? Yes. And then Matthew does that throughout the entire book of Matthew in the gospel, um, using trying to link the two narratives mm-hmm. uh, that we find. Which is not necessarily dissimilar from what we will do. Um, sometimes if we want to add a certain sense of authority or wisdom mm-hmm. to a point that we're making, like we'll quote Lincoln or we'll quote Sojourner Truth or Frederick Douglass or you know some sort of historical figure that collectively we all admire mm-hmm. for some reason or recognize their wisdom or their insight. And I'll say, you know, this is kind of like uh, what Ben Franklin said when he blah, 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 blah. Right. Like, oh, yeah, it is like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're right. Wow. And everybody says. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And just as important with those quoting historical figures as quoting this, it's, it's, it's important in the context in which it was written. And then to also acknowledge that God's spirit is actively alive at work and, and can be making these links yeah. for us. And um, that, that's, a, that's a, it's a thing we do every Advent, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, all these words were written a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And we keep going back to them. Right. <laughs> and finding truth and, and wisdom and beauty in them. Certainly. So. Right, and there's a there's a yeah certainly a, a universal truth that I think we we find in this stuff that we pull out and try to apply to our modern twenty first century context and our modern twenty first century minds and all that stuff and mm-hmm. we have the benefit of um, two thousand years of scholarship. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Of for two thousand years, people have been studying these words and and maybe. Damon, through the Monday check-in, we're adding a small amount oh, wow. to that, right? We, we are contributing to the, the, the body of words that have been spoken about these yeah. words. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, whether or not our words are quality, we'll leave up to our listeners and to history. Yeah. Um, it could be, you know, that 100 years from now, when people are sitting in seminary and they want to Find a commentary on Matthew eighteen, Matthew one eighteen through twenty five. They'll yeah, they'll play our Monday check in. Yeah, they'll just you know they'll use the computer chip that's in their brain, and just bring it up <laughs> mentally, and then listen to it inside their minds, and away they'll go. Yeah. There's uh, one word that stuck out to me while I was reading this that I don't really. This doesn't. I don't think this is going to be helpful really at all. Uh, <clears throat> Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. He's unwilling to expose her to public disgrace. He may or may not be willing to expose her to private disgrace. Well, I I mean, wouldn't the private (laughs) disgrace be the dismissal? You would think. I don't know how that could not be eventually a public disgrace. Right. Well, it depends on how many people knew that they were engaged. I suppose well, they all know. I mean, you're not an expert in first century Palestinian context, right? No, I'm not. But come on, <laughs> just by that, everybody knows. So that does point out just kind of I'm how just, s- just from like my experience of walking around in the world that I currently walk around in, right? If you and Hannah yeah, had broken knows. off the engagement a few months before you were supposed to be married. Yeah. Right? Everybody and, knows. They don't know now. They'll know over the course of time. Right. And if... I, I, I'm not going to use you and Hannah as an example, but if, if a couple that you knew <laughs> broke off an engagement before the wedding and then the bride started showing... Turned out to be pregnant... Yeah, mm-hmm. there would be some private and public <laughs> disgrace. That's that's an interesting point you make, though, because this is 
pretty scandalous, actually. And we sort of gloss over it. We've accepted it as the narrative mm-hmm. of Jesus' creation, Jesus' um, right. right. But really, you're talking about a, a couple that is engaged, betrothed to be married. Mm-hmm. She comes home to him one day and says, by the way, I'm pregnant. Yeah. He decides that he's going to, being a righteous man. He knows it's not him. Dismiss her, but do it quietly and privately because he doesn't want to expose her as we read the public disgrace. Mm -hmm. And when he's ready to make that decision, he has a dream and an angel says, don't do that. The child she is carrying is of the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. and you will name him Jesus and he shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. And then Joseph says, yes. Right? And so I feel like we do gloss over a little bit of, of really the, the, the scandal mm-hmm. of this story. Um, yeah. And that's the problem with knowing the, how the story ends. Right. right. That you miss, or it's easier to miss some of the intrigue along the way. Yeah. Like when you know, like, oh, it's all fine in the end, so I don't really need to worry about, you know? Yeah. So when I was in high school, my senior high youth group was always responsible for the 11 o'clock service. Mm-hmm. And one year we, we wrote a play, a modern retelling of the Christmas story. Mm-hmm. And that's when it occurred to us how scandalous this was. Because sure. yeah. in our play, Mary had to go home and tell her parents that she was pregnant. Mm-hmm. And then she had to go home and tell her fiance that she was pregnant. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you tell that from the perspective of a modern teenager, for us, that would have been like 1995. Um, all of a sudden you realize how scandalous this story really is. And uh, it was, um, I, I was playing Joseph. And uh, the girl playing Mary in my youth group, she was a year older than me. Her name was Krista. Mm -hmm. And I remember how we wrote this script and acted it out. And it's like, oh, wow. Like this, this would be a a big deal for us. (laughs) This is very uncomfortable. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. When you think about it, and this is like an interpretive thing, right? Um, Like there's a way of, there's lots of different interpretive methodologies, mm-hmm. right? When we look at the scripture and one of them is to read it like a story and think of it as a, as a story. It's written as a story. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not written as a historical text. Right. Um, and so while you're reading it, like think about the emotion that the characters are experiencing. Right. That isn't very rarely. Sometimes we do, we get, um, I was, I was rereading, um, the Hannah and Samuel's birth narrative mm-hmm. with Hannah and like she openly weeps and she's depicted as weeping right. in the temple, but we don't really get any sense really that much of Joseph's distress or Mary's distress and anxiety in the midst of, in the midst of all of this. Right. We could get a very dry... He resolves to do this. Yeah, I mean, between the lines, right? Yeah. I mean, Her husband like, Joseph. You kind of, you kind of a, have to pump the brakes a little bit and then slow down. Right. And think, okay, like, okay, what's going on for this character? Right. Right now, for this person. Right now. That they, right. Mm-hmm. Right. It doesn't always come through. And there's, <coughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's both scandal and, and then there's, there's wonder in this too, right? Sure. I mean, imagine. Yeah. Imagine learning this news that your fiance is pregnant, mm-hmm. going to sleep. I imagine it would be hard to sleep if you would just <laughs> learn that news. I'm just, I'm projecting um, how I would feel. And going to sleep and then in your sleep being visited in a dream by an angel that gives you very specific instructions that you're going you're gonna to take this child on as your own. You're going to mm-hmm. give him a name. And then connects it to the Isaiah prophecy of Emmanuel, God with us. And you wake up and you go, okay. And I imagine there was some internal dialogue with Joseph. Was like, was was that just a dream? Was that actually an angel? Was that the hummus that I ate last night giving me indigestion? Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, man. 
shoot, that just reminded me of a line <laughs> from um, A Christmas Carol that I can't think of right now. Okay. But at any rate, the hummus thing. Yeah. And, and also, like, the, um, tells you something really, really wild. Yeah. Right? Um, that this, oh, this child is actually from the Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit? Right. <laughs> For starters. Um, and, and it's sort of, it's sort of like that you get that you're, I imagine Joseph trying to hold, or being tempted to hold these two, two extreme thoughts at the same time. Right. Right. That, um, okay, Joseph knows that Mary is pregnant. Why is Mary pregnant? Because either she did something wrong or something sure. scandalous happened, took, happened yep. right? Um, or it's, it's this just oddly wondrous Supernatural. Thing. Right. Like it's, yeah. it's either this devastation of some sort. Right. Or <laughs> it's the almost the exact opposite of that. Right. Like you, you pick, I guess, which one you want to think that this is. And I, like, I wonder. This is just wondering now at this point. But like two thousand years ago, with less development of scientific knowledge, was there an ability or a willingness to suspend disbelief or to lean into the supernatural a little bit more than we would necessarily encounter today in our modern era? Sure. Perhaps. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know, because if you didn't have a scientific explanation for, I mean, you think of any sort of natural occurrence, right? Uh, an eclipse or mm -hmm. um, an earthquake or whatever, and you didn't, you couldn't explain that, and so you explain it by saying this was supernatural, right. then is it possible that Joseph was a little more willing to accept a supernatural narrative than yeah. you or I might be? In 2022? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe, possibly. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's what, I think these are the interesting things that happen like, when, you, like, when you kind of slow down. Like, Wait a minute, what? <laughs> Why is it, what, what is Joseph feeling right now? Um, the line that I, I remembered, you talking about the hummus. Yes. Maybe it's just bad hummus. Um, at least in the Muppets version. Of a Christmas Carol, which we've established on the Monday check-in, that most of Damon's knowledge of classic historical literature is uh, the Muppets, Muppets version. Muppets related, sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. So carry on. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Scrooge is <coughs> visited by in the Muppets version his partners, uh, the brothers Marley, uh, not just one Marley. But at any rate, and part of what he says is. Um, you could just be like the result of like of something bad that I ate, and he says there is more of gravy than of grave of you. <laughs> and the Marley is being played by uh, Waldorf and Stadler. Yes, they just think that's hysterical. That is funny. Yeah, there's more of gravy than of grave of you. There's more of gravy than of grave of you. And really, I mean, if we're gonna map that over my hummus comment, it makes sense why it would have connected. Because hummus is, is sort of, on some level, similar to gravy. It's, it's not quite as liquidy, but it, it, it is a topping that you put on top of things uh, to flavor them and eat them. Sure. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's an adjunct. <laughs> an adjunct for gravy? <laughs> well, just for food. Yes. <clears throat> right? Yes. It's there to enhance and slightly alter your main item. Yeah. So um, with, with that, <laughs> well, the other thing that I want to point out oh, about this passage, yes, is that because um, you were talking about how you were, it was in your mind because you were writing about it for the devotional, yeah, and the devotional um, this year is taking a look at four different names for Jesus, yep. right? And you shall call him dot dot dot, right? Because Jesus ends up with lots of names, right? <laughs> um, and he's given names by lots of different people at lots of different times, yep. Which and which is interesting, if giving a person a name 
means you're taking responsibility for them, which way. is how we started this conversation. Right. That is interesting. That We could explore that on a <laughs> totally separate version of this right. podcast. So in the devotional, we, like, I, we have this passage, but it's split into two different weeks. Because he gets multiple because he names. gets named right? Jesus mm-hmm. and then gets named Emmanuel. Well, and before he's Messiah. Right. Now, the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then later on, you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Yeah, Jesus is the derivative of Joshua, Joshua which yep. means he saves, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. Yeah. And Messiah um, means Christ, and it means anointed one yep. in its original um, Hebrew language. And then we get Emmanuel, um, God is with us. Except the is is actually not supposed to be in there. Um, apparently, according to the Hebrew, the, or the, the, I, I read a, a deep dive into the word Emmanuel, and it, it's, the, the, the verb is is not in there. So Emmanuel means God with us, not God is with us. And that changes and what is the difference? fundamentally. Right? So Emmanuel, God is with us. That means God is, is like with us. And so with a low Christology it could mean God is with Christ instead of God is Christ. God with us is Jesus is God with us. You're not tracking. I think I need to have a deeper understanding of the intricacies of is? Verbs and adverbs and Fair whatever. Enough. We won't get into that on this one. <laughs> Participles. You're saying that God with us is is implies more a more complete yes sort of a thing. Then God is with us. I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> it feels. Um, it's one fewer word. It feels less complicated okay. to me in some way. And you are a person of fewer words. You're an English professor here. We do. God is with us. God with us. God is with us. Okay. Almost like, almost okay. like. So we're saying we're saying that. God with us, we're really, we could, you could replace the word God with Jesus. Yep. Right? Yep. Okay. It's a, okay. This to me seems like a degrees sort of a thing. Yeah, I okay. think so. Yeah. But any, all of which to say, I, I read a commentator who made that distinction, mm-hmm. who did a deep dive into the word Emmanuel. But, yeah. but I, I think it's it. interesting because we have Messiah, which is anointed one, Jesus, which is he saves, and Emmanuel, God with us. So the anointed one who saves is God with us. Mm-hmm. All in one short prescribed passage <laughs> yeah. for this Sunday. Mm-hmm. That's significant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also the, a connection to the past, right? Because Jesus is the Greek version of the Hebrew name Joshua. Joshua, yep. Which is somebody else's name. Right? <laughs> Like that's that's an old name that's being that's being recycled, repurposed. Yep. Here. And, yep. Um, being filled in a similar way that God saved through Joshua. Right. God will now save through Jesus. Yes. Right. Um, which then of which ties in well with all the genealogy that comes before it. And, you know, Matthew knew what he was doing. Oh, yeah. A writer of the Gospel of Matthew knew what they were doing. Um, and yeah, I had somewhere else where I was going with that, but I don't remember what it was. No. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. <coughs> yeah, man. And I, my intention was to preach a relatively short sermon yeah, since got, we have the uh, lessons and carols thing going on. You got seven to ten minutes on Sunday morning. Okay. Can you do it? I think I can do it. Will it preach? It will preach. All right. It preaches every advent, doesn't right. it? Mm-hmm. It seems to. I, yeah. I do find 
if you go back and look, this is my sixth Advent season with this church. Um, and I, I have found myself focusing on the Annunciation to Mary mm-hmm. more often mm-hmm. than this Annunciation to Joseph. Sure. So I'm giving Joseph a little bit of due this year. Um, yeah. But the Annunciation of Mary still uh, is such a powerful one for me, too. Yeah. Joseph's got a little bit of agency here. Yeah. You know, that I was just that whole um, Jesus Joshua connection. When I was at Hastings College, um, a student asked me, like, can, do you think that a person can understand the Newer Testament if they don't know the Older Testament? And I said, no. You might, or they might think that they understand it, but they don't really, right? Right. And it's that sort of, like, knowing who Joshua was, <laughs> like, gives you so much more information in understanding who Jesus was. Right. Right? Um, like, and knowing that genealogy and knowing who King David was gives you so much more information yeah. on who Jesus was believed to be. Um, so so I'll, I'll cycle this all the way back to the Angels Aware Christmas program the kids did mm-hmm. and just point out that theologically it was teaching our kids a lesson about the connection to the Old Testament and New Testament uh, because there's a section where they're talking about the, the major and minor prophets mm-hmm. and how there was an attempt through those, starting with Moses, yeah. And then an attempt through the major minor prophets to help people um, connect with God mm-hmm. and, and connect with their faith. And how basically <laughs> they all tried and were not all that successful. Right. And so the incarnation, Jesus being born, was God's way of like, I've, I've, I've tried through Moses, I've tried through the major prophets, I've tried through the minor prophets. And it, it, was, it was neat because if the kids were paying attention, they're connecting they're old in their New Testaments in, in ways that are theologically sound. And our, our scholar in residence, Dan Deffenbaugh, uh, as he was leaving church on Sunday, he goes, that was, that was a really good description of the major and minor prophets. He focused on that one particular part, which was an important line in yeah. the context of Angels Aware, but it was like, yeah. it was like a 30-second mm-hmm. blip over the course of a 45-minute production. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I love that Dan picked up like, hey, that's good theology. And I love that it was good theology, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So, anyways. Yeah. And that part um, reminded me of this um, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, mm-hmm. uh, where the rich man dies, and um, he's he asks, he sees Abraham, right. I think, um, in heaven or with God, and, and, and he's, okay, it's fine, which is also kind of an ever, it's kind of, also kind of a Christmas carol kind of a feel. To yeah. that story. Yeah. Um, and he kind of finally, okay, fine, it's too late to me. Um, but could you send somebody to go and warn my brother? So that he doesn't suffer the same fate right. that I do. Yeah. And, and they say, he's got the prophets and all of the writings. <laughs> if he doesn't listen to them, then... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe he sees Abraham and Moses I'm up there. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. But yeah. This is just kind of funny. Yeah. But at any rate. Okay, so it'll preach. It'll preach. You think. Uh, right. It's going to be hard to preach it in seven to ten minutes, but I think I can do it. We'll just take out all of the instances of is. <laughs> Thank you, David. That'll save a little time, I, I would say. Uh, what's going on in the life of the church that we should be aware of? Oh, my goodness. So, uh, yeah, this Sunday will be the fourth Sunday in the season of Advent. Uh, but the day before that, Saturday, we do have a United Harvest food distribution. Uh, we rely on volunteers to help us with that distribution. And with Hastings College being out, we could probably use some extra hands. And so that's at 930 on Saturday morning. We're doing our United Harvest food distribution. If uh, you can join us, show up at the Peace Center and you'll be assigned to a task. And that typically lasts about uh, no more than three hours. It's usually more like two, two and a half hours. Um, and we could definitely use some help. And, and it's a great way to um, share the love of Christ and to put into practice these things that we talk about during the season of Advent. Uh, so we hope you can join us for that. That's Saturday. Sunday is Advent 4. Uh, we will have two worship services, our 830 service, which is more of a contemplative style service in the chapel, followed by our 
1030 service in the sanctuary, which as we mentioned, will be a service of lessons and carols with a short message from me on this Matthew 1, 18 through 25 text. And Celebrate Band is playing and also uh, our little kids' handbells. Yes. Playing yep. during that service as well. So. Yep. Um, this Wednesday, see now I'm, I'm out of order, but that's okay. This Wednesday is our last Wednesday Night Live uh, for the year. And uh, there's some special things planned, including a special Christmas meal for the kids. So that should be delightful. Uh, there's no choir practice on Wednesday night for adults or for uh, no handbell practice either. So it's yeah. just Wednesday Night Live, mm-hmm. youth act- uh, children's and youth activities. Um, let's see. Sunday. No adults. There's- no, there's no forum. There's no forum. Correct. Cathedral Brass just did just did our, our last forum for the calendar year on Sunday. I'll get that posted online um, today or tomorrow. Yeah, check that one out on our YouTube page. It, it was pretty neat. Yeah. So so there's no forum on this coming Sunday. There's 830 worship, 1030 worship. Uh, there's no <clears throat> senior high youth this Sunday evening. We did our little... Christmas dinner last night. And you and Hannah hosted that at your house, mm-hmm. didn't you? Yep. How'd that go? It went really well. Good. Yeah, had, a, yeah, had folks over. So that was good. Uh, we adhered to some of our Christmas traditions. So that's good as well. And um, <laughs> there will be junior high. Youth, youth group this, on this Sunday night. Yeah, this Correct. coming Sunday, December yes. 18th. Yes. So... Uh, but that'll be then. That'll be the last one. Yeah. For until January. So. And then uh, that it's Christmas Eve, uh, and we'll catch you next week before Christmas Eve, where I'll be trying to work out my Christmas Eve sermon, which I have not done yet. Still trying to figure out what direction that's going to go. But uh, Christmas Eve, uh, you have four opportunities to worship with First Presbyterian Church of Hastings on Christmas Eve. The first is over at College View. Uh, we'll do a worship service at 2 o'clock in the afternoon in the lobby of College View. So um, if you're not wanting to be around large crowds, uh, that's a good worship service for you. Uh, and our choir, uh, members of our choir show up to help lead the music. And our organist, Linda, goes over there and plays the piano. And we do a, just a, a simple service there in the lobby of College View. So that's at 2 o'clock. 5.30 in our sanctuary is our sort of family-oriented uh, Christmas Eve service. 7.30 is our more traditional Christmas Eve service. Both of those include the, the lighting of candles at the end with Silent Night. Uh, and then at 11 o'clock is our um, contemplative. contemplative service. Yeah, yeah. Vespers type service. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then the next day is Sunday um, and also Christmas Day. So on Christmas Day, uh, we will have a 10.30 uh, Christmas brunch um, here at the church, um, worship slash brunch slash fellowship time, right? We're going to try to make that time together be a reflection of an egg bake. You just throw it all in there. Veg, egg, cheese, meats, meat. We're going to just throw it all in there. So fellowship, prayer, song, Scripture, collaborative message, forehand piano piece. Just throw it all in there. Apply some heat, which in this case we'll call love. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And it comes out as a batch of deliciousness. Yeah. So it'll be at 1030 in the Fellowship <laughs> Hall on Christmas morning. There's no 830 service on Christmas morning. So. All right. I think that wraps it up for us. Should I close this in prayer? Well, the other thing we should probably Uh-oh. mention, the Advent devotional. Yeah, I didn't bring a copy as a visual aid. We but. alluded to it. Yep. Um, so the devotional is still going. We're not to Christmas yet. Um, and they're still still encouraging folks to um, you know, take advantage of that reverse Advent calendar. Um, do some join in the work of hope to benefit some of our uh, ministry community partners. Uh, collect some items uh, to, to support others in the community. You can bring those to the church really any time and put them in the parlor. If you don't know where the parlor is, someone will help you find it. Uh, and you can bring them. Um, we're going to distribute them early 
in January. Um, so, but you know, bring them in anytime in the next couple of weeks. So. Is that it? I think that's it. All right. Should I close this in prayer? Yes, please. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the opportunity to focus on the many names we have for Jesus, including Messiah, Jesus, and Emmanuel. And so God, in the season of Advent, as we're preparing our hearts and minds both to celebrate Christ's birthday 2,000 years ago and also for his triumphant return, may we worship the Anointed One. May we realize that Jesus does indeed save us. And may we find comfort in the fact that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, each and every day of our lives. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. With those things said and done then, until next time, toodaloo.